those. Uh, so we're getting into the guts of the, why we're all here, the occupancy models. So remember, at the core of it all, we have our questions in conservation and ecology, distribution, um, and abundance and species interactions. And so what we actually see is the questions we could answer with occupancy models are all highlighted here, where we could estimate the distributions based on the occurrence of species and their threats and habitat relationships. We could model metapopulation dynamics across the sites of our species of interest through occupancy models. We could um, look at how species interact, either through competition or predator-prey interactions uh, as well. <clears throat> through, uh, so the metapopulation dynamics is usually done through possibly multi-state models um, or multi-season models, and the species interaction models are going to be um, multi-species models where we're looking at competition and predators and prey. So remember, again, we have our hierarchy of data. Now, if you recall, I said the ultimate is abundance or even, well, actually the ultimate is density, a known number of individuals per a unit area. And we estimate that with capture, recapture. And so here's an example of an ocelot, a capture and a recapture. Or if we tag individuals, we have their known numbers uh, on their ear tags or whatever, and we could estimate uh, how many individuals there are. And if we record the space, <clears throat> the space of capture and their actual capture locations, we could model where they move and how they move and in a spatial capture recapture model. The classic is the Lincoln Peterson estimate, right, where we just look at the population size, we have a, we capture, we do a survey, we mark a bunch of individuals and release them. We do a second survey, we have the size of that second sample, and then we divide that by the number of marked animals recaptured. So this is kind of the original formulation of the capture recapture model and how we estimate detection probabilities. <clears throat> And really, uh, occupancy model is just an extension of that capture capture um, modeling process. Uh, but remember, the capture capture requires individual identification data from individuals, whereas the species occupancy is we're just looking at the species occurrence. So species distribution models, sometimes called ecological niche models, sometimes called uh, environmental niche models, I think, things like that. There's a, quite a few different names for these, but um, these are the types of models like Maxent you would use, Max-like is another, is another one. Um, there used to be some other ones like GARP and a couple other, uh, Wallace I think is one. Um, and so this assumes areas with no detections are not suitable or occupied habitat based on animal ecology. And so this is where we have species distribution models only use, use um, presence only data, right? So we can use museum specimens or some uh, bycatch data on a species and estimate their uh, um, distribution. But it assumes that areas that are not, that have no presence are bad habitat. And so it basically collects random sites, random information from the, from the whole study area and makes a, um, a map like this where you're looking at the probability of, of uh, or it, it's like a relative habitat suitability index. And then you could uh, you know, turn that into a logistic output where you have green is suitable habitat, and orange is not suitable habitat. But remember, you're making bold assumptions about, uh, for example, here in the Yucatan Peninsula, you have, <coughs> you have a whole study area there of suitable habitat, but no data from it. And so you're making really strong um, assumptions about where these species occur. 
But if you're using something like citizen science data from iNaturalist, you might be biasing your inference towards, um, towards uh, areas where people live or popular areas where people uh, do hikes or surveys or, or um, you know, bias towards national parks, for example. So presence absence data arise from a two-part process, right? Presence data arises from when a species occurs in an area of interest and the species was detected by investigators. But absences tell us a different scenario, right? It's species does not occur at a particular area or the species does occur there but was not detected by investigators, right? And so that's where the occupancy models come in. So we have in the basic occupancy model that we're going to run today, we have two parameters of interest. We have psi, which is the probability that a site is occupied or used by your species, <coughs> psi sub i, um, and p sub i, which is the probability that, that the species is detected given that the species is present. So this is our way of robustly accounting for our inability to detect a species even when it's present. Now, one quick caveat here. For example, the bison, if you do a um, survey, uh, you fly over a prairie and you count the bison or you look for the bison, if there's no place for the bison to hide, you don't need to estimate detection probability, right? There are plenty of scenarios where detection probability is so high that you don't need to model it. Um, lecking prairie chickens, lecking sage grouse, for example, you're at the peak of a, of a hill or mountain looking down at the lecking areas. You see these displaying sage grouse with 100% certainty, you know, more or less, that you don't need to account for detection probability. Um, you know, you might have limited uh, instances where you miss, where you miss a little bit here or there, but since we're only dealing with our interest is presence or absence, if, for example, you do all these valley surveys for sage grouse and you count 150, but there were really 154, it doesn't matter because that gets paired back to a one as opposed to a valley that you see none and you have a zero. And so you wouldn't need to account for detection probability in some of these instances. So the assumptions of a single season model, we assume that the sites are closed to immigration, emigration, uh, births and deaths. <clears throat> we assume that the surveys are independent. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, the detections on day one are not net, are independent of detections of day two, or if you have uh, you know double observers going out. If uh, someone observes you know um, <clears throat> uh, a bird, if you're doing point counts, uh, observer A should not be telling observer B what they see. They should be independent, right? Uh, there's no unmodeled heterogeneity. So heterogeneity is going to be those habitat associations, those detection probability effects, and we need to account for those in our models. <clears throat> and the species is identified correctly, so there's no false uh, detections, right? So sometimes, um, <clears throat> you know, with camera trap data, if you're dealing with, uh, if you are in an area where you have, for example, um, mountain hare and, uh, not mountain hare, mountain uh, cottontail and desert cottontail. Those really can be very difficult to tell apart from camera trap images. And so you don't want to run an occupancy model for a mountain cottontail where you've accidentally identified a whole bunch of desert cottontails as mountain cottontails because it's gonna throw off all of your inferences. So just making sure that you can uh, you know, accurately um, identify your species but in fact, with, you know, with all of these hierarchical models, you, there are actually models that have been created to account for false identifications uh, in the identification process. So remember, obtaining presence absence data is usually less intensive. 
logistically cheaper than trapping and tagging individuals, can cover a large area or time frame, and might be more practical depending on your uh, objectives. Uh, remember, we have all different types of occupancy survey techniques. All of these can, can um, result in uh, pres repeated presence absence data. Data, and so what the survey data within the occupancy framework look like are as we create detection histories. And so our detection history looks like this. Our camera trap was out for seven days, right? This is a crested guan here to the right. So uh, our camera trap was out for seven days. We did not get a photo of a guan the first day, second day, third day, or fourth day. We got a picture of a guan the fifth day. In fact, we got a picture of five guans the fifth day, right? But it's just a one, right? We don't care about the counts at this point. We just want to know the species is present. Then we did not detect them the sixth day and detected them again the seventh day. Now, our assumption is the guan was there the whole, the whole seven days. We just failed to detect them five of those seven days. Now, the cool thing is occupancy models can account for missing data. So here's another example where we detected them the first day, missed them the second and third day, got them the fourth day, but then a leaf fell over the camera trap lens and we couldn't see what was happening on day five or six, but then blew off and we got them again on day seven. So we can account for that just as simple missing data in our analysis. So then we'll calculate or collect a whole bunch of covariates to try to predict the distribution of these guans. And we can use different software. Today we'll be using Presence. So I think we, sh we shared the link hopefully in the chat uh, of Presence. If you just Google Presence software, the USGS site will come up with a download link. Um, so you'll just want to download that once we get into the exercises here shortly. Uh, you could also use the unmarked package in R. But what do these parameters mean? Well, we have a biological reality where we have psi is the species is present, or one minus psi is the species is absent. And so if you look, we have these uh, probability statements that follow out depending on how we detected our species, right? So for example, 101, uh, right, is our detection survey, is actually the probability that species, this, the species is present uh, times the probability of detecting them times one minus the probability of detecting them in survey two times the probability of detecting them in survey three. So the mechanics of the model is that it's a maximum log likelihood estimation, right? We're just estimating the, the maximum, the, um, the maximum log likelihood. Uh, so this is just, you know, a typical frequentist approach. We have a logit link because it's, it's a logistic regression, right? The output is either, the data are either zero or one. And then we use model selection based on information theory, where we have AIC model selection, and we can do model averaging across uh, multiple top competing models. So the study design, again, depends on the question. Sometimes you could make inference as the original application of occupancy models was PAO, the proportion of area occupied. But um, you, know, you want to consider uh, grids with random sampling. Maybe you want to sample all your units in a study area. Or if you're interested in habitat relationships, you want to do stratified random sampling like here with these grizzly bears in uh, Alberta, Canada, um, where you can see the different colors of the dots represent different habitats uh, sampled. Or if you're interested in species interactions, maybe you want to put those along trails where you will detect uh, more of your species of interest. Uh, here's just an example of um, you know, a simulation of what you might expect are the number of repeated surveys required for a study. So for example, if your psi is point is like a 10% probability and your probability of detecting them is about 10%, you need about 14 repeated surveys to get some, uh, you know, a strong uh, inference. But then if you look 
it doesn't take much in your increasing detection probability to reduce the numbers of surveys to, you know, two, three, four, or five uh, repeated surveys. <coughs> Again, remember species specific detection probabilities. Some species like this poison dart frog are very easy to see. Some species like this little leaf litter frog are very hard to see. And so you have to remember that different species are going to have different probabilities of detection. And then just here's another little example of the expected precision given the number of repeated surveys when you know the psi is 0.4, the detection probability is 0.3, and you could see how many surveys you might need to estimate, um, you know, with, with strong inference based on the um, standard errors uh, estimated here. Here's just an example of, uh, of a neat survey from biological conservation where you have, um, you know, all of these boxes in Thailand are sites that were walked uh, trails and looked for signs of tigers, leopards, and doles <clears throat> and their presence or absence of tracks. And then the dots are more strategically placed camera tracks because they wanted to more effectively estimate the associations of the tigers, leopards, and doles. And so they, they targeted those areas a little more strategically to get at that inference of the direct effects by um, putting those cameras in areas where they, you know, had a higher probability of detecting the species of interest. Grids and inference is just, uh, I just wanted to point out that you, the scale of your grid or your site will uh, inform your inference. And so depending on how uh, big of a total study area you have might influence your grid size or your, what you define as a site or how far your species moves will define how you calculate your covariates associated with the site. <clears throat> Uh, so here's just a neat example of, of an application that I think is pretty cool that is apparently over 10 years old now. Uh, man, time flies. Um, but here's an example where uh, Kriti Karanth surveyed a whole bunch of experts across India and asked them to plot on a map where they knew these different species were, occurred in India, and then she could account for detection probability because she surveyed multiple um, experts in these areas. And so each expert could be an independent repeated survey. And then she could model the uh, probability of occurrence of all of these different species across the whole country. So there's a whole, all tons of um, neat applications of the occupancy models and the scales we use. So remember, we incorporate covariates. We have detection covariates and occupancy covariates, right? Detection is P, and this is influenced by sampling or things like climate and weather. Maybe deer are less active in the pouring rain, and so you expect the probability of detecting them to be lower when it's raining <clears throat> or lower when it's very hot. Whereas occupancy is what's driving their occurrence in space, right? A detection is the is variable over time or could be variable over space, but occupancy is only variable over space, right? In the single season occupancy model, where we look at habitat or other species occurrence driving those patterns. So here's just a table of some examples of forest cover, forest plantations, distance to village, proximity to protected areas, roads and our, uh, you know, predicted effects on the carnivore communities, for example. And so remember, <clears throat> even though this is a generalized linear model, we're still just fitting a mathematical model with our covariates to predict the logit, oops, oops, the logit of P, which is our detection probability. So we have an intercept, and then we have the effect of covariate one plus the effect of covariate two plus the effect of covariate three and so on and so forth. And the logit of psi, which is our, our um, uh, intercept, beta naught is our y-intercept, 
plus the effects of the different covariates, right? And so <clears throat> what we have to remember is a positive slope means a positive association and a negative slope means a negative association. And so once we're including our covariates, we can make our inferences based on those betas. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are multi-season models that we're not going to get into today, but basically we're going to have study areas that we repeatedly survey over time, and then we can model local extinction and colonization across our sites and look at what's driving those patterns. <clears throat> And then again, looking at multiple species, we can look at uh, predator-prey interactions, like that study from Thailand, where they looked at how tigers inter interact with doles and how that might influence, uh, be influenced by different prey in the study area. We can look at com oops, competitor models. <clears throat> we, and then we can estimate species interaction factors, which is, you know, how the presence of, say, tigers affects the presence of, say, doles or leopards. And we can have the species be independent or, uh, you know, co-occur more frequently together or co-occur less frequently to get together than um, uh, assumed under random conditions. So we don't always get these uh, interesting observations where we can directly assess species interactions. And then community models, oops. We can estimate richness. We can borrow information from guild members. So if we're interested in say the mustelids, we can borrow information from, um, you know, uh, um, a mink uh, to inform our long-tailed weasel uh, models. If we think that they're um, using habitats and that might not be a good example, a, a fisher and a martin because we assume that they use habitat similarly, but one is detected more frequently than the other. Uh, we can look at how those communities and um, richness changes over time. And there are all different types of ways to conduct these community models where you treat um, you know, species as sites, species as surveys, and then there are just gonna be differences in interpretation of the probability of detection and the probability of occurrence. And so the things to remember again, to define your question, what your site unit is. For example, if you, if you have a whole bunch of forest patches, that's easy to define a site. Uh, each site is a patch. And maybe you survey it with each patch with multiple cameras. Or your camera is your unit because you're your um, study area is, is some contiguous forest, and then you have to define what your site is. Maybe it's a 50 meter buffer, maybe it's a 300 meter buffer, a kilometer, five kilometer buffer. That's all going to depend, depend on your question and your inference um, and how far your species moves, for example. And then, you know, define your survey methods, the number of occasions, potential covariates, and then the interpretation, psi and p, are going to vary depending on those things that you defined, right? So uh, something like psi or detection probability are not always easily um, comparable between different studies because I might define p as the probability of detecting a deer in 10 days of camera trap survey, but someone else might define P as the probability of detecting deer in one day of camera trap survey or 50 days of camera trap survey. And so those differences highly influence what P is and affect your comparisons and they're not uh, always comparable. And, uh, and so there's always gonna be differences in studies and survey methods across uh, different studies. So let's uh, actually